One year from now, something very, very special is happening. And you may be asking yourself, is it Barbie 2? Is it Oppenheimer 2? Are we gonna have another mass release of two big movies and make all these memes about it? Although that's a lot of fun and those movies did incredibly well at the box office. That's not what's happening. In our Catholic Church, one year from now, there is going to be a Eucharistic Congress taking place in Indianapolis, Indiana. Literally exactly one year from now. And what that is, is 80,000 Catholics are going to descend upon Indianapolis and have time of worship, praise, retreats, healing, speakers for five days in Lucas Oil Field Stadium. The, yeah, where the Colts play, the big Lucas Oil Field Stadium. And there's going to be like uh, renowned speakers in our church are going to come there and they're going to be, you know, speaking on the power and need of the Eucharist. And this is also part of our church of a revival that's happening. Um, this year is going to be a parish revival for the Eucharist. Last year was a diocesan revival for the Eucharist. Next year is going to be the Congress. The year after that is going to be going out on mission and having this renewed inspiration, this renewed love and life for the Eucharist. So why is this Eucharistic Congress happening next year? And why is there a Eucharistic revival happening within our parishes and dioceses last year, this year, next year, and year after? Why is this happening? Well, the world is hurting. The world is in pain. Look around you. Talk to the people that you know. Talk to your friends, your family, young people, old people. Listen to the news. Watch movies. There's a common theme out there. The world is hurting. The world is in pain. People are personally in pain. And now than ever, more than ever, we need Jesus to heal us. We need healing. We need healing in our society more than ever. There is so much division. There is so much scandal. There is so much pain out there in people's lives. And we need healing. I know I need healing. I've come to grow and know that more and more in my life, that I need healing. I'm a sinner and my sins cause me pain. Although I'd love to think that there was no consequences for my sin for years Sin causes pain, division, and on me personally, and it also affects other people. And I remember when I was a kid, I, um, I remember like praying and he hearing the story of St. Dominic Savio. And St. Dominic Savio was this like, this perfect kid who like went to confession and commune every day, was like a student of St. John Bosco. He was like this like anointed young guy. Apparently his confessor said that he never committed a mortal sin. He died when he was 14 because he had like a cough, had like tuberculosis, you know, said all these profound things um, in life and he, and he died. And I remember reading about him when I was a kid and I was like, wow, like think about that. Like St. Dominic Savio, I want to be like him. I want to never commit a mortal sin. I want to be someone and I'm laughing right now because, um, you know, I remember thinking that as a kid, like I was like 10 years old, like, wow, I just want to be like St. Dominic Savio. And as I've grown older, I've kind of found more inspiration in my life from the life of St. Augustine, kind of like a big sinner who's kind of committed a lot of sins and had big conversion in his life, a lot more than Dominic Savio. Pretty quickly, I was off the like, wow, I just go to confession and communion every single day, never commit sin boat that St. Dominic Savio apparently uh, you know, was on and, you know, a little, little less anointed, a little more need of healing. And so that's been a big journey in my life that I've realized, like, I need healing. I needed healing. I need healing. I will need healing. And Jesus is the perfect person. He is the one we, who can heal me. So why do we need this? Why do we need a Eucharistic Congress? In our Catholic Church, we have the answer to all pain. We have the answer to suffering. We have the one who is there for all of us who loves us, wants a relationship with us, Jesus Christ. And Jesus gives us, gives us the gift of the Eucharist, his full body and blood, soul and divinity in the Eucharist. And we can receive him and he can heal us in the Eucharist. He can heal us. The Eucharist, as St. John Paul the Great said, is the source and summit of our faith. As Blessed Carlo says, is the Eucharist is the highway to heaven. And we have great men and women who've come before us who've talked about the like absolute majesty of the Eucharist. So we want to revive, have a revival, and renew our spirits, our faith, our lives to the Eucharist and realize that the Eucharist can heal us of so much of what ails us in the world. So the question is, how? How will the Eucharist help us in our lives? How will the Eucharist heal us? How will the Eucharist help us with the scandal in politics? How will the Eucharist help us with a divided education system? How will the Eucharist help us when we feel like the world is creeping in on our churches and on our people and our values, how will the Eucharist help us? Well, there's a lot of misconceptions about the Eucharist and there is some incredible research and data out there that shows that like 
people don't really understand the Eucharist. And not just like not Catholics, Catholics ourselves in our own church within our walls have a lot of wild misconceptions about the Eucharist. And so this time, this revival is also a good time to kind of get it straight about what the Eucharist is, who the Eucharist is, you know, who is at the center, who is at the source and summit of the Eucharist, and then to let that inspire and inform our everyday lives. Let it be fuel for our mission in our life, for our jobs, for our schools, for our relationships, for our marriages, for our friendships. Let the Eucharist be fuel that helps us in those things. One myth that you hear a lot, and that 70% of Catholics believe is that Jesus is not really present in the Eucharist. That's a myth. The myth is that Jesus is not present in the Eucharist. It's not his real body and blood. It's just a symbol. 70% of Catholics believe that. So a reason why this is going to help and how this is going to help in our lives and in our daily lives is because believing that Jesus's real presence is in the Eucharist is like a radical belief. This helps push against apathy of our everyday life. Apathy can be so strong. I know apathy can be strong in my life, you know, sitting in traffic and kind of wondering about, you know, all the KPIs to do at work, things that, you know, are happening in life, getting, going to different events, responsibilities, and apathy can just like take over all these things I have to do. And, you know, our faith, my faith life can just be looked at as like, okay, you know, go to mass and, you know, have some prayer. And then, you know, that's, that's kind of a, you know, it's almost like a hobby, but like, no, like Catholic faith is like the ultimate antidote for apathy. It is going to push our minds to like the farthest limits of where we can like go. Believing in the real presence of the, in the, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist is going to push our minds and push our faith and make us stronger because like that is a radical belief that is so much better cooler more you know intense belief system than any other belief system out there you know what are some belief systems you know there's a, this kind of like common belief system in america now which is like the just be kind belief system why can't people just be kind we don't need religion we just need people to be kind well newsflash everyone thinks they're kind doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you fall on doesn't matter if you're religious or not religious everyone thinks they're kind being a Catholic and believing in the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, that is a strong, big time belief. I mean, that is like something to put the, a stake in the ground and believe in. And in the Bible, when Jesus talked about this, it was radical back then. It was radical 2,000 years ago. It's not like right now, post-World War II, this is just like a belief that it's like, oh, we're so much more evolved now, so we think it's radical. No, no, no. They thought it was radical back then. In the book of John chapter six, Jesus says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And Jesus says that to people. And like like the, the people who heard that, disciples, people who were listening, his followers were like, this is insane. He's literally talking about cannibalism. He's talking about eating him. This is insane. And what did Jesus do? He doubled down. He looked at the apostles and he said, are you not gonna go with them? Are you not gonna leave because I said that? Like he was like putting it on them. Like this is a, this is a radical belief. And are you not going to go believe them? He didn't say, oh, hey guys, um, just kidding. I was, it was just a symbol. He didn't say all of you leaving, don't leave, don't leave. Uh, actually, it was just a, it was just a joke. It's not really my body and my blood. It's actually just like a symbol. It's just in mem remembrance. It's just like a memory. No, no. He looked at the apostles and said, are you not going to go leave with them? And of course, there's that great line. Peter says, my boy, St. Peter he says, like, Lord, who else are we going to go who to? You have the words of everlasting life. Who else are we going to go to? And I, I just love St. Peter because, like, I just, like, resonate with that, that kind of, like, practical thinking. Just, like, I mean, we've come this far. We've seen you perform miracles. Like, we'll get to believing in this. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of work with this, what you just said. We'll let it process. We'll talk about it tomorrow. But, like, you, you have the words of everlasting life, Lord. We know that you're Lord. Where else are we going to go? I'm not gonna go be a fisherman again. You're my guy, I'm gonna stay with you. Like, I love that thinking. Also in the book of Mark, Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. He doesn't say, this is a symbol of my body, this is a symbol of my blood. He says, this is my body, this is my blood, as he's breaking the bread. And like, that back then, you know, that was the start of the Eucharist, 2000 years ago. Jesus was the one who instituted it at the Last Supper. And then, Further along in the Bible, 
as the apostles were breaking bread, this became this symbol of like Christ breaking bread. And then when Jesus came back on the road to Emmaus, Jesus, well, Jesus was with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, but they didn't know it was him until he broke bread. And that was like kind of the beginnings of our church of breaking bread and saying, this is my body, this is my blood. That was like Jesus. That was like the, the calling card of Jesus. So it was a big deal back then. You know, these disciples weren't like, oh yeah, I feel like I've heard the breaking bread thing before. Where did that come? They're like, no, oh my gosh, this is Jesus. This was a real big deal back then, just like it is now. So that's one of the reasons why this Eucharistic Congress is happening, because there's, there's some myths out there, one of which is that people believe that Jesus isn't really in the Eucharist, that it's just a symbol. So this is going to be a time to reignite our belief and feel the presence and power of Jesus in the Eucharist over the next year. A second reason why this revival is happening is because it forces us to evaluate our life and walk humbly with the Lord because we can't receive the Eucharist in a state of mortal sin. That's another myth. The second myth that exists is that people believe it's okay to receive Jesus in a state of mortal sin without going to confession. We just think, well, you know, the state of my soul, mortal sin, venial sin, is there really any difference? Who really knows? It's like, that's a myth. That's part of that apathy as well. But knowing and understanding that we have to have clean hands and a pure heart forces us to be humble in our walk with the, our walk, our walk, forces us to be humble with our walk in the, with the Lord. We have to go to confession. We have to confess our sins. It resets us on the path with Jesus. And so by acknowledging that we can only receive Jesus in a state of grace, it forces us to be humble, to pray, examine our sins, examine our conscience, go out, go to confession, and then receive Jesus. And that's where we can really feel the power. That's where he can heal us. That's when he can then do the work in us, when we have clean hands and a pure heart. And this also harkens back to ancient like, Jewish tradition. This doesn't just like go back to like, you know, post-Vatican II. I mean, like the Jewish tradition of breaking bread. So remember, Jesus broke bread. That was a symbol of Jesus. He said, this is my body and broke bread. In the Jewish tradition, thousands of years ago before Jesus, the um, people had to wash their hands before they broke bread. And actually, that still exists today, that in the Jewish faith, before touching bread and breaking bread, Jewish people have to wash their hands because that was an important part to have clean hands. And we know back then that was kind of this, like, this, this external thing we could do to prepare ourselves to come in contact with, you know, all things that are holy. They had to clean their hands and wash their hands before they came in contact with bread. And that's why today we have to clean our hands and have a pure heart before we come in contact with the bread of life, Jesus. So this, this idea of being in a state of grace goes back thousands of years. You know, bread, you know, the food, and now the bread of life. We have to have pure hand, pure heart, a pure soul, and be in a state of grace. And so when we recognize that, when we accept that, it forces us to then examine our conscience, be humble, admit that we're wrong, admit that we're weak, admit that we need grace, admit that we need confession, admit that we need Jesus on this walk of in life, that we're gonna fall down, but we're gonna get back up, we're gonna go to confession, and then we're gonna receive the Eucharist as fuel to carry on and to keep going and to go on stronger. And a little bit of biblical context for this is St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So again, we're talking about even St. Paul, like a few years after Jesus um, ascended into heaven, talking about this idea of having pure heart, clean hands, coming before Lord and coming before Lord in the Eucharist in a, in a state of grace. So this myth that exists, that it doesn't matter if you're in a state of moral sin or not a state of grace, that you can still receive communion. This Eucharistic revival is so important because it forces us to examine that and to, to like rebuke that and say, no, we actually, we're going to confess our sins and we're going to revive this idea of going to confession and then going to, going to receive the Eucharist. And then we're going to let the Lord heal us. And that's then where the Lord can heal us. A third myth that exists nowadays in the Eucharist and then a reason why the, this Congress is happening, this revival is happening, is that young people are leaving the church because the church isn't up with the modern times. That's a myth. Like, hey, like the church is failing because it can't keep up with modern society. That is like the furthest thing from the truth. 
What is true is that young people are looking for answers more than ever. Young people are seeing, I would say, like the, the cracks in the wall of like capitalism, money hungry people, um, you know, you know, communism, these th like these these institutions that just crumble when you really examine them. Um, and young people, I think, are fed up with it. Young people want truth. Young people want authenticity. Young people want real life things in their life that they can use and have be a part of their life, not just fake like platitudes. And what better way to show young people the truth than by showing them who the truth is, by directing them to Jesus Christ, who is the source of all truth, the source of all beauty, the source of all love. So it's like young people maybe are leaving the church and are looking for answers, but this Eucharistic revival is the perfect opportunity to draw young people back in. It's like, hey, you're looking for answers? Go to the one who has the answers. You're looking for truth? Go to the one who is truth. Hey, you're looking for the best life to live? Go to the one who's going to give you the best life. Not just the bare minimum. Jesus is not a bare minimum God. Jesus is going to give you the most full and fulfilling life out there. So, you know, an example of this is in Salt Lake City earlier this month, 10,000 people descended upon the city to have a Eucharistic rally, kind of a rally over the next year to, you know, to kind of set the year, set the intention for the year um, before this Eucharistic Congress. So in their, in their diocese of Salt Lake City, 10,000 people, a lot of them young people came and kind of had mass, had healing, had, um, you know, worship, had prayer together. And that's like a huge, huge number, 10,000 people, you know, and that doesn't get any press in the news. That doesn't get any, um, you know, awareness by anyone. But I'm here telling you that 10,000 people earlier this month in Salt Lake City, Salt Lake City came together um, and in honor of the Eucharist to devote themselves to the Eucharist more and more. At the rally, Bishop Solis was there and he had some powerful words. Now, Bishop Solis is the first Filipino American um, to become a bishop in America. So shout out to all my Filipinos. You know, I live in the Philippines, love all my Filipino brothers and sisters. Um, he's also the first Asian American to be a bishop. And we have the same birthday. So this is my guy, Bishop Solis. You're out there in Salt Lake City. Do your thing, bro. I'm here for you. I'm cheering for you. And he had some great words that I'll read right now that kind of shows the power of the Eucharist and why young people are going to be drawn to it. Because the Eucharist, he goes on to say, the word Eucharist means thanksgiving. It's the highest form of prayer we offer God and the source and summit of our Christian life. Yet too many remain indifferent, do not have faith in Christ's real presence of the Eucharist, or appreciate this blessing. So basically all the things I've said leading up to that quote is the reason why this Eucharistic Congress is happening. That's why this Eucharistic Congress is happening, these pilgrimages are happening, it's really exciting. Um, I hope you're excited, I'm getting excited um, to, you know, see what happens. I hope I can be involved with the Eucharistic Congress in some way, you know, the pilgrimages or whatever. I don't know, going to the Congress. We'll see. It's a year from now, but we'll let the details kind of take care of themselves. Um, and I'll also be making some videos um, surrounding the Eucharist. About once a month, I'm going to be releasing a video about different parts of the Eucharist, whether it's adoration, um, you know, Eucharistic miracles, whatever it is. Um, I want to kind of make companion pieces that focus on the Eucharist and its importance and why it's fuel for our life and fuel for the mission in our life. So it's exciting. It's a pivotal moment in our church. It will be looked back upon as like something big. So if you're looking for something big in life, something big in your life that you can say like, hey, I want to be part of something special. The 10th National Eucharistic Congress next year in Indiana, that's something special. That's something worth going to. That's something worth being involved in. And at the heart of the Eucharist is Jesus. And Jesus is the one who saves. Jesus is the one who heals. So I know I'm trying to revive my own spirit with the Eucharist by going to adoration, going to Eucharist more, going to communion more, um, and kind of just taking part in this revival that's happening, doing my little part. So hope you all do too. Reach out with any thoughts, questions that you have, what you've seen about the Eucharistic Congress, that's cool, and reach out to me. Um, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, check out all the episodes that I'm going to do um, for Backseat Media. Thank you all for checking in. Peace.